All right, today we're going to cover part one of the glute Larry model. Uh, I was fortunate enough to present on this recently and received enough questions that I uh, thought it would be important to, or, or most efficient, to just do a video over it. So the overall aspects of the glute layering model, our goal out of this is to consider and correct inefficient hip firing patterns. And through this goal, we've created this uh, systematic approach uh, to glute function. So uh, we'll go through all of the different layers as we progress through this in part one. Uh, but from what we're seeing uh, with uh, advances in technology, um, having both force plates and EMG uh, data available to us in a very rapid fashion, um, and then understanding our athletes' firing patterns, so this um, hip extension firing pattern that we're going to discuss today, um, we're seeing changes in muscular efficiency and improvements in their force output um, by altering this uh, firing pattern that we're going to go through today. So ultimately, uh, this is going to be many systems within a system. You're going to see uh, aspects from many different practitioners, and, and it might not be anything new, uh, but it's more about how the system is implemented uh, to create change that will show you that our athletes are realizing. So the hip extension firing patterns, um, there are three possible methods that an athlete can use, and you can see in this picture here, um, obviously, what we're going to coach is going to be that the glute should fire first in hip extension. So it should go glute, hamstring, and then opposite QL. Uh, and Cal Dietz has a ton of videos up on um, discussing hip extension firing patterns. Uh, and I'll make sure to link that in here as well so you can go follow uh, those. Um, but for that reason, we're not going to get into the three different patterns as much. Just know from what we're seeing from our athletes in changing these patterns the efficiency and the force output that we're seeing, um, that glute should fire first in hip extension. And this is really important to understand because hip extension and flexion are required for any locomotion pattern to be completed. You can't, if, or you can't move without hip extension or flexion. Um, obviously, different movements require different extents, but from we should continue to focus on this state of explosion firing from the inside, so glutes, outwards throughout the body on a movement. So the optimal firing pattern like we talked about is going to be glute to hamstring and then opposite QL. And again, we want to create this state of explosion. All right, so driving forces from the inside out, you can see in this picture here, working from the inside from one out to two, out to three. And this is going to be critical to prevent overuse injuries. If, if you are contracting a muscle and firing back inwards, in order to create hip extension, you're going to start to see overuse injury, the likelihood increase. And obviously we can't prevent everything, but that likelihood of that uh, overuse injury is going to be decreased dramatically. Um, when this pattern is utilized, the body is going to compensate. And I, I was fortunate enough, I did a, a, a podcast with uh, Joel on Just Fly. I'll make sure to link that in here as well as to some of the theories and why uh, we feel that the body begins to compensate, whether it's structural or stress. Uh, it goes into a little bit more in depth there. Uh, but basically your body has to complete two things in order to survive. It has to breathe and it has to move. And we talked about hip extension and flexion being required for movement. So if those muscles aren't readily available in the most efficient manner due to whatever reasons, um, the body's going to find cheat patterns, even there, even if they're inefficient. So, and this is where that likelihood of, of an overuse injury is going to increase because some of those non-major muscles are now being, whether it's the, the opposite QL or the hamstring are being required to take over for that, uh, as primary movers for hip extension. So glute layering pyramid overall, uh, We've kind of discussed this in both ways, uh, but we think that it's the more we see it, that we should put structural at the bottom um, and, and we'll demo some of these in part two. We'll give uh, full hyperlinked, hyperlinked examples, uh, but structural is key. Without structure, um, your body is not going to produce force to the highest level. It's going to almost um, enter a protect mode uh, to make sure that it, it doesn't uh, rip itself apart like you're going to make sure that you're protecting yourself at all times uh, from there 
RPR, Reflexive Performance Reset. We're not going to go into, into how to implement this today, but just understand that, that it is utilized to a high extent um, for, for us in our glute layering model. From there, glute isometrics. So again, these pieces might not be anything new to coaches, but it's about their implementation. So we'll cover some of the, um, the actual brain changes that are seen uh, when these are implemented in the manner that we discuss. And then 3D, uh, three-dimensional contralateral movements. So we've created a, a sheet here at Denver that, uh, or, or an aerobic training phase, basically, that is going to focus on utilizing these aspects um, in full kinetic chain movements. Now, obviously, there, there's a transfer of training piece, and that will be covered more in part two, uh, give you fully hyperlinked examples uh, to that as we progress through this. So the structure, like we talked about, this forms the base of the pyramid uh, because without the structure, that protect mode is utilized and your body's not going to fire efficiently. It's going to inhibit or downregulate or be in uh, defense mode and, that, and that's not going to allow optimal uh, performance or force production. So altered biomechanics are going to mean inappropriate range of motion and or loading mechanism and basically our goal here and luckily we have, I mean, sports med staff, um, chiropractors that are of an extremely high level in the area that we can utilize if we run into this. But there are also some basic exercises uh, that you can implement in your programming to assist in this. Ensure that your athletes can actually achieve hip extension because that's such an issue uh, that we see with our athletes that are stuck in class all day and then um, come out of six hours of class and then try and hop right on the field and play. Uh, because if they can't achieve that hip extension, then that glute is going to be inhibited. Um, and then the the foot aspect um, in this picture here, it's it's a model of triplanar loading. Uh, but basically, understand that this is the mechanism that should take place in order to eccentrically load that glute. So as if that subtalar joint can't um, function, can't complete that eversion or the pronation of the foot then you're going to not create the, um, the appropriate eccentric load up the, through, I mean, ankle dorsiflexion, but tibial medial rotation that will drive the femur to slightly medial, medially rotate. And then from there, that eccentrically loads the glute and then to contract and, and propel itself through. Um, so constant game of telephone. So if you're not addressing aspects at an athlete's foot and they're locked up, then there's a high likelihood that you're going to not be receiving the appropriate message up at that hip level than to complete the movement in the most efficient and powerful manner possible. So spotting structural issues. Obviously, coach's eye is huge, um, but there are going to be times where like, if you're working with 40 athletes on the floor at once and it's just you, it's going to be very difficult to see that. Uh, but aspects that, that I look for is the hip positioning gait. So are they stuck in that relative flexion or that anterior pel pelvic tilt that we've talked about um, because they're sitting in class all day? It's a very sedentary lifestyle now, even for student athletes. Um, that's going to create a compensation pattern that can be predicted. Your athletes are going to go one of two ways. Uh, they're either going to, if so, if they're stuck in that anterior pelvic tilt, they're either going to bring their ribs down to match their pelvis. And if you think about that as, as that rib uh, comes down to match that you're going to be placing more stress on your hamstrings that's it as if um, if that athlete's uh, hips and torso were to be vertical like truly vertical you're that it's going to be like you're reaching with your hamstring on every stride so that athlete is going to place more stress on their hamstring repeatedly and eventually the likelihood of that hamstring breaking down from that stress is going to be increased the other type of athlete, uh, they're going to drive their ribs up or maintain a vertical posture, even though their hips are rotated forward. And this is going to be an athlete that's utilizing their back to complete hip extension as the primary mover. So it's going to fire from their QL then to their opposite hamstring and then to that opposite glute. All right. So if it's left QL, then it would be right hamstring and right glute. And this is the athlete after especially a longer distance of running, let's say you're doing some type of longer conditioning, that's that athlete that's going to be looking up at the sky because their hips are still slightly forward while their chest is up and their head is back. They're creating that tension through their back to, to complete each stride. 
Um, the lateral sling, obviously a single leg stance uh, support phase is critical. Um, and then like we talked about um, through the foot, um, if that midfoot's not functioning at a high level, then you're gonna see a drop off at your glute. Creating athlete awareness is critical. Now, if, you, if you've never coached them into this, then it's gonna be difficult for them to have that. But as you coach this more and more, that athlete awareness of how they should be completing movement um, and what it feels like when their pattern's corrected, they'll start to realize when they're not functioning at the most uh, efficient level. Uh, finally, Athos. Athos has been huge for us realizing uh, a structural issue. So again, if I'm on the floor with, with 55 plus athletes at a time, I'm not gonna be able to pick up on every movement pattern possible. We use quite a bit through our warm up progressions uh, to see how the, the athletes are moving at that time. But overall, there's no way I can pick up everything that's going on. So what this is an example of is the, the picture in the bottom right here. The solid line is glute. So you can see left glute is the red and the right glute is the blue. And you can see this athlete's a, a overall pretty high functioning athlete. We call our higher functioning athletes uh, those that um, utilize above 25% glute and that's a, a total. So you can see this athlete's um, almost in the, above the 30s the majority of the time with that solid line. And then the dashed or dotted blue and red hamstring or uh, lines are the hamstrings. So you can see right here at about 11, six, and we didn't, we had a download. Um, so this athlete didn't wear the, uh, the um, Athos for a few days and we came back and on 11, six, that athlete clearly had a structural issue. Um, as seeing that glute drop off to that significant extent, his body had entered that protect mode. So what did we do? We, we addressed some structural issues through his foot, ensuring um, that, that his hips were capable uh, or were in the appropriate positions. And then you can see the next day, he immediately jumps right back to almost his 35%. And this is, this is a huge tool for coaches to use to, to ensure that their athletes are functioning at a high level through their glutes. Uh, reflexive performance reset. Like I said, this, this is a huge piece of what we're doing. And overall, we're, our goal here is once our athlete is structurally in alignment, is to correct incorrect patterns that are being used. Um, otherwise, that poor movement pattern is gonna be ingrained repeatedly. So just because they're structurally in alignment does not mean you've addressed all of the hip extension firing patterns. So belly breathing is critical here. So sympathetic breathing through your chest, that apical breathing, uh, because of the ties of the diaphragm to the psoas, um, sympathetic constant chest breathing is gonna reduce that psoas and the glute. So really our goal here is to make major muscles, uh, major muscles again. And I'll make sure I connect to their website here as well. Like you said, this is a system within systems and it's how we've pieced everything together. Uh, so you can check out if this is something you're interested in, um, in um, attending a course. Uh, but again, this is a huge part of what we're doing because we're going to make our major muscles, our major muscles again. Can we utilize appropriate breathing patterns uh, through our diaphragm? Can we then um, increase the use of our psoas and our glutes and create an appropriate length tension uh, relationship so we can have the availability of that glute to hamstring to opposite QL and, and create that state of explosion? Uh, regardless if you've uh, attended the course or not, you need to make sure that you have an honest relationship with your sports med staff if you are a strength coach. Obviously, um, the, the athletes are able to reset themselves, but the, that open line of communication is going to make life so much easier um, when you're utilizing this method. Glute isometrics. Um, this is kind of, uh, one of the, the biggest pieces that, that we've utilized, and, and again, this is nothing new. People use these all the time. Um, but our goal, now that we have addressed structure and the reflexive performance reset, make sure that that athlete has um, the, the appropriate firing pattern or those muscles, those major muscles are working, um, is to increase the utilization of the glutes. So we're gonna talk about the, the corticomotor area of the brain and how we're using this to address that. But we're gonna start isolated at first. Um, and, and our goal here is to have a sore butt. Really, when our athletes complete this, uh, especially for the first two probably-ish weeks, 
um, they're going to be extremely sore due to the time under tension, even though we're using only green minivans. Um, but if that athlete is not sore through their glutes, then that's going to be a problem because that means they're going to be driving stress into their back or their hamstrings, even in an isolated position. So that's what we'll start in the most isolated, like basic clamshell at the beginning, and then we'll progress into um, more difficult um, gravity based exercises. So again, we want to use this after the appropriate firing patterns are achieved. That's going to ensure that we're not compensating. So that's going to increase the likelihood of that sore butt after completing this. So cortical motor excitability, a really interesting study done on this, um, increased the, the drive from this area of the brain after isometric training. So what this study did is they did 20 minute sessions um, and after six days, they increase the firing of the, the cortical motor area of the brain after six days. So a significant change in six days with 20 minute sessions throughout. And what they showed is it actually is transferable to other non-isolated glute exercises. So they did different exercises after and showed that that increased firing is still occurring. So what our goal here is, is to create enough time under tension to, uh, allow more real estate for recruitment for those glutes. So we've put them through structure, we put them through the reflexive performance reset, but now can we increase the amount of capacity that brain has for those glutes? And now we can use it as a priming piece as well. So uh, what we've seen with our athletes with the EMG, and we'll show you this in part two as we kind of track them, is that six to eight minutes, can make a huge difference in an athlete's um, priming. So that that we've actually moved towards using this in a uh, pre-lift and tra uh, training as well as practice and game setting um, because we're, we're priming that system, that cortical motor excitability is up and that availability or real estate for that glute is also increased. Um, the three progressions, we are gonna change time under tension. So, Consider it like and each athlete has a, a different cup size, quote unquote, for their cortical motor area. And once that cup size is filled up, then you're going to have to move on to a different piece or, or muscle because that athlete is going to compensate at that point. So we use movements. Um, we use a cross crawl, lateral cross crawl, and I'll make sure that I uh, link these uh, early to allow athlete to, to move a little bit, take some stress off the glutes as an isolated setting. but the, that consistent movement is also going to keep that cortical motor area at a high running at a high level. So let that um, athlete recover a little bit and then bring them right back to the glute isos and you haven't lost any time. Now, obviously, as they progress, we want to increase that time um, that they're capable of handling the isometrics. Uh, we'll start mid range muscle belly, um, taking the viewpoint that the GTOs at the extreme ranges are already a little bit overactive. So we want to slide. Um, quote unquote slide some of that um, availability back to those spindles and then from there we'll work to our extreme range of motion and then obviously ground to standing we need to be able to take these glute isometrics and make them um, more available to our athletes as they're required on the field obviously we're not doing banded clamshells as our transfer of training piece onto the field uh, but they are extremely efficient at utilizing their glutes in that pattern because it's such a, an isolated spot uh, again, those progressions, I'll make sure that I hyperlink all of the, the five progressions that we use that consider each of those, um, as well as if you want to check out the Just Fly podcast that I mentioned before, kind of goes through those three progressions in a little bit uh, uh, more detailed setting. So 3D contralateral, I'll make sure I link this, um, but it's going to apply all these previous concepts in a full kinetic chain uh, aspect. So now it's can we utilize the glute to hamstring to opposite QL and hip extension over and over and over again. Um, transfer of the glutes in all three planes. Um, and again, the goal is continued to be sore, but if your athletes are finishing these movements and they're not, if they're sore in their back, if they're sore in their hamstrings, that means either they're firing inefficiently or they don't have the tolerance. Their cup is not big enough to do the volume that was prescribed. So cues through this. Uh, squeezing glutes, driving through your big toe, and uh, finish as tall as possible. I enjoy using that. It, it creates more of a, of a rotate your hips under you as you finish tall, rather than if you, say, finish forward. Some athletes uh, will naturally start to drive with their back. 
Uh, so again, this was part one of the glute layering model. Uh, we'll get part two done uh, here in the near future, and that will cover the implementation and, and show some examples of the transfer of training and some of the results that we're seeing through this.